Thanks, Maureen, for your reminder. <laughs> okay, so uh, today uh, we are very, very honored to have Anthony uh, here to uh, kind of talk about esports uh, with us. Um, so we, uh, this is, uh, I have to admit in the beginning, this is, I have a really, really limited knowledge about this field. So that's why we're here to learn. So um, Anthony, we're very honored to have Anthony here. So Anthony, I know you have several titles. You're, uh, uh, you are, I know you're involving this uh, regulated esport board and then, oh, and yeah. Also yeah. Okay. So I'll have you to introduce, uh, you know, your all all the cool things that you've done, and then uh, Anthony here today is also gonna share with us some of the uh, kind of uh, the industry about uh, esport. And uh, so if you have any questions, so Anthony doesn't mind if you want to ask him question during his presentation, or you can just put it in the chat. I will be monitoring the chat, but we will definitely have a QA and a um, in the end. So uh, that's, um, so Anthony, do you want to take over the floor? Sure, sure. Thank you very much. Um, uh, my name is Anthony God, and uh, I, 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 get, I just have the one title, te technically, I guess I have more than one, the CEO of a company called Godhammer. Uh, which was recently changed from a, uh, it was called G3. Uh, and I'm here and you can see I'm in a hotel room here in West Palm Beach. So I'm on a business trip here, but um, yesterday we launched Esports Illustrated, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, and the field that I'm currently in uh, is what they uh, call esports in America. It's just video game competitions or competitive video games, most other places, but the term esports has taken off and it stands for electronic sports. Uh, prior to that, uh, uh, to starting this company, my history is 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 sort of a tech entrepreneur in entertainment. Uh, I've done a, a, I like doing first things. It's a lot of fun for me, uh, like challenging. So I, I worked on the first computer generated television show, and on five more shows after that uh, called Reboot and Beast Wars, Beast Machines, Spider Man, uh, Weirdos, War Planets. Uh, a bunch of television shows uh, that feature the use of computer technology uh, were kind of parallel to Industrial Light and Magic developing. They were doing it for film, we were doing it for TV uh, in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, after that, my first job was actually Hasbro. So I should go back. My first job was Hasbro as a toy designer. But then I started doing more entrepreneurial things and I realized I didn't like working in an office. Then um, we uh, I created a cable network that we sold to Comcast with the first video on demand channel. At the time, video on demand, nobody knew what it was. Nobody knew why it would be important. You know, the cable TV is big. Why would anybody want to watch a show that that wasn't even recorded? Um, but it turned out to be obviously uh, a real disruptor in the in the, in, in the entertainment industry. Uh, I also. Uh, brought uh, Asian games to America and including the first free to play model to to uh, which is when you don't pay any money to play a game. It was created by a company called Lenny Chen and Nexon in uh, South Korea. So we brought uh, those games to the States and Disney acquired that company back in 2006. Um, and then we worked for Walt Disney for about seven years uh, as chief creative officer for Walt Disney Interactive. Uh, and we worked on a whole bunch of really fun stuff, including Star Wars games, um, Kingdom Hearts, which was a very popular game series, uh, Marvel, we just acquired. We, during, they bought my company, and like in the next two months, they bought Star Wars, and they had Marvel, and uh, we brought back Kingdom Hearts. So pretty much anything that Disney had was at our, at our disposal, and that was a lot of fun. And I left Disney in uh, 2016. Uh, and we started this company, which is currently just, you know, it, it's a it's a startup, even though it's year four, we're still getting ready to to do what we've been planning to do. Um, and we just launched Esports Illustrated yesterday. So it tells you how recently of the, the, the startup this is. But to, I'm going to show a presentation. Uh, and I'm, I apologize if the presentation is uh, redundant to some of you who know this stuff. Um, what I think would work best is if uh, if there is a question during the presentation, just 
interrupt and ask the question then because it might be it might work out better that way um, for everybody. And the other thing I'll say is, um, and oh, it, a lot of the other titles that um, Yelling mentioned were are sort of incorporated into the the the, the presentation. So I'm I'm the chair of the regulated video game and esports committee, and and what that really means yeah. is that, that we're trying to we're not trying to we we've created a national committee uh, to legalize wagering in video games or wagering in uh, on video games and in video games. So not only your ability to play somebody else for money, but your ability to win something in the game itself. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit too. And now I have to find a presentation that I just had open two seconds ago. Here it is. So I'm going to hit share yelling and let me know if this is working. And thank you all for taking the time to meet this morning. I really do appreciate it. Yep, it's working. Okay, great. Uh, so this is a presentation deck we use at the uh, the regulated video game and esports committee, and the the concept here is that um, I'm I'm sure all of you have seen sport book commercials left and right. It's kind of inundating the airwaves, um, but sports books don't actually make a lot of money in the sense that. Uh, the amount of money it takes to acquire a user is very close to the amount of money that the user will give you. So you end up with very little profits and there's a, a huge amount of competition in that space for major, major, major players like DraftKings, FanDuel, Caesars. Um, there is a bigger opportunity, which is the the opportunity to, than sports, bring the video game world into the world of wagering. Uh, and the reason this deck was initially created was to educate uh, legislators and regulators on what that world is. So it starts very basically. Uh, we're going to skip this slide here. It starts very basically as to what is eSports. So eSports stands for electronic sports or electronic base sports. And it's essentially any competition that you have with somebody else using a, a, a video game. Uh, it takes the place of so esports is a name that was kind of coined about 10 years ago it isn't formalized in the sense like uh, uh like the major league baseball or, or nfl or um uh, sports it's it's a whole bunch of different things and in different countries different games can be different esports so in the u.s it tends to be eight to ten titles in asia it tends to be about three or four titles and in europe it tends to be a lot more uh uh pretty much the gamut of everything, including using mobile phones to compete against other people. But the basic idea is always the same. It's you playing other people in a video game and in some sort of organized fashion. Uh, and one of the things that all of us kind of realize is that in the same way that MTV was sort of the zeitgeist in the 80s for music, it was always the backdrop of our lives because I'm old. <laughs> and we used to, just, MTV was around everywhere. So fa fantastic. In the same sense, Video games are the backdrop of the 2020s. Um, and whenever you get a bunch of, of millennials or Gen Zs or Gen Alphas together in a room, it's almost certain likely that if they're not on social media, they're playing in some sort of game against each other, always, right? It's it's not, uh, when we use this presentation to talk to regulators, a lot of them are, are generally older, over the age of 50 or 60, um, and the idea of video games being for younger people, like for kids, is is kind of endemic and built into the, you know your mindset. But when we tell people that no, that the average age is much older than under eighteen, uh, and that this isn't a fad, this is the culture. This is literally what the culture is made out of, right? So video games are the biggest form of entertainment on the planet, and it's not a, a temporary thing. It's a global movement. The games are all global for the most part. They're played, the same games are played everywhere. Uh, and it's, in my opinion, a permanent thing. This is not, uh, you know, a, a fad that will leave in the next couple of years. This has been building for quite a long time. And what started out, you know, you see this slide here, this sort of shows kind of the progression of the evolution of gaming. What started out in the 1980s in arcades uh, with people, you know, putting quarters down on the arcade and see who yeah. can beat the person score. Uh, kind of upgraded itself as, as home consoles and computer equipment in increased in capability. Uh, 
you know, I remember going to the University of Cincinnati and, and that picture, the second picture is almost identical to the way that we would run, you know, these sort of local area network parties. We just connected our computers together and we played games until 6 a.m. in the morning and oh my God, we got to go to school. Um, and that sort of started progressing in the 2000s into bigger rooms as networking became better and then evolved into a much bigger um much bigger thing, uh, as you see here, this competition right before COVID, where uh, you could win millions of dollars in a competition watched by tens of millions of people. Same. Um, and it's funny that a lot of people that we speak to don't realize how mainstream and endemic esports is. Um, and when I say that is, if you're over a certain age, there is a high likelihood that you don't know that this world exists. Even though if you're under the age of 35, it's primarily the only entertainment media that you have is, is, is it's unlikely you'll have cable television. It is unlikely that <clears throat> you will uh, watch TV primarily on the big screen. Most of the time you'll watch it on a phone or computer. Um, and it is very, very likely that some sort of gaming related entertainment or just you playing games is part of your life is extremely high. Um, I, the slide here on the left shows the YouTube gaming, which is just gaming on YouTube, uh, just that kind of content segment. And this is a, this just came out a couple of days ago, but <clears throat> if you look at the, the 500 million hours logged in daily active viewers, that's a it's just an unbelievable amount of media is related to video games, whether we're watching someone else play or we're watching a major competition or we're watching someone talk about games. Games are the main passion of this generation. So you see that <clears throat> uh, 46.2 million Americans watch what we call esports competitive video games every year. Right. So approximately, you know, less than 20 percent of the population, 15 percent of all Internet users, uh, the total esports audience and the way we define audience is people that actively watch these things is around 532 million viewers. It, I just updated these numbers the other day. Five, 532 million viewers are regular watchers of esports. Um, 31 million people watch Twitch every day. And these are just Americans every single day so from any given moment from two and a half to six million people are watching twitch uh which is a a website devoted mostly to gaming um, and those numbers 2.5 to 6 million are much higher than the combination of espn cnn msnbc you combine all of those and twitch still has more viewers at, at any given moment um, and it just shows you the power of, of video games and 2.8 billion people consider themselves or play video games regularly and consider themselves gamers. So that includes mobile games like Candy Crush, console games like the Xbox and the PlayStation, and playing games on a computer. Anybody have any questions so far? Uh, yeah, just a quick, quick, yeah. quick, uh, quick thing on Twitch. So I thanks for this presentation. I was pretty interested in this today uh the, the last company i worked at they they got pretty heavily involved um in the video game space they actually bought a they bought a team and they owned an arena and i think like that last slide you showed like i think the owners were an older group of people and they when they realized that you know they couldn't sell out a hockey game but they had a, a e-game tournament and they were booked 100 days in advance for the whole weekend they were they're blown away and started buying teams but i think one of the things i think challenges at least at that time and i guess i'm curious if it evolved it's like twitch i guess they couldn't we couldn't figure out how to monetize twitch like i is it like still free to watch or are they running ads on i guess i don't watch twitch i'm not one of those 30 million but oh, i yeah, guess yeah. like what is the what's the business model there i guess uh, i'm just a little curious if you know about it i don't it's I do, not I do. a different question i do and actually we're we're creating a new um uh, business model ourselves to kind of challenge that. So the business sure. model on Twitch, you know what? I'm just going to put it on the screen. Let me just load it up. The business model on Twitch is that if you get to be a popular enough, what they call a content creator or, or streamer. Okay. 
that you can right. um, generate on. revenue yeah. on advertising. So if you have a significant amount of followers or viewers of, for any given awesome. event, Twitch will share with you their revenue that they put uh, in a way against your will. But if, if let's, I'm just kind of making this number up. If once you have more than 10,000 viewers, Twitch automatically starts putting ads into your streams. Okay. And then you get 30% of that, those ads, sometimes as much as 50%. And if you're a really good streamer, more than that, they keep, oh, man, they, I can't wait for the, the arms. terms have changed a little bit, but um, yeah. Twitch right now live, right? So you can see that it's okay. live. And you see some of the recommended channels are the ones that are most active right now. So there's 17,000 people watching. And I see this ad automatically comes in because it's over the 10,000 mark. Sure, sure. So, Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's almost similar to YouTube, but live. It's the same thing. The, the big difference well, is, and you see here, there's another ad. So already this person is monetizing very well, right? This group, LCS. Um, you can see, and here's the actual competition. So this is a live competition. Actually, we have people, my company has people there now. Um, okay. Competition, but yeah, if you get a large enough audience, they start monetizing. So if you go to his Watson, let's see if they have any ads there. So they, they, they're they not over that number. So the ads aren't appearing there. Sure. But the ads okay. might appear somewhere. If they maintain those users for five minutes, you'll see an ad very likely. Okay. Um, and that's how you start Very. making money. And some people make hundreds of millions of dollars on Twitch. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, and YouTube works the same way, right? So if you go to YouTube and you go to the, the video game sections, just type esports or just type uh, video games. It's exactly the same thing. So you'll see that um, people creating content around video games, you'll see the number of views, 1.1 million. When you hit a certain yeah. threshold, you'll start getting um, the revenue. Sure. Um, it's not a lot of revenue at first. You really have to go over 500,000 to, to make anything significant. But some people are able to get 40,000, 50,000 every day and partly that into revenue where this is their main lifestyle. This is what they do for yeah. a living. Yeah, this uh, is my kid's dream. So, <laughs> <laughs> Like, so you don't want to play real sports? No, no. These are sports. <laughs> well, and that's the thing. A lot of people don't re really realize that the, the video games are... I have two kids that are both on the, uh, the high school rowing team. They yeah. don't watch my... You know, the Philadelphia Eagles, my home team, they just went to the World, World Series. Uh, well, actually, we did go to the World Series. Philly, Philly's also went to the World Series. We lost both, by the way. The World Series yeah. and the Super Bowl. But... And the world and the MLS Cup. God, we had a bad year last night. But um, they don't care. They don't care because yeah. they don't watch that stuff. They yeah, only it's, watch it's... video games. That that's all they care about. So they go right from rowing, which is you know a top athletic sport at their high school, and they go right to video games as soon as they're back home. And yeah. and that's sort of where the culture is, right? And 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 that's I mean that's what I did when I was a kid. But it was I was the the weird one. Now everyone mm. does it. The one who's the weird one is the one who doesn't do it. Yeah. It's completely flipped on its head. Very similar to how Marvel movies used to be the things for geeks, and now who doesn't go to a Marvel Marvel movie, you know? Sure. Cool. Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah. So the types of esports, competitive electronic sports, are all over the place. Some are recreations of real sports like basketball, FIFA, soccer. Others are sort of video game versions of a real sports. Like one of the most popular ones is a game called Rocket League, which is a game. <laughs> Is, every time I think about it, it's just so silly. It's a soccer game played by cars, right? And the cars have like these rockets on them. It sounds silly. It is silly, but it's a lot of fun and it's a lot of fun to watch. And it's one of the most popular to watch because it's easy for anyone to follow uh, what's going on. Some of the most popular are games that are um, uh, military combat simulators like Call of Duty where you have, you know, essentially people trying to kill each other with video with video game weapons, very realistic graphics, extremely realistic graphics. The most popular game in the world, depending on the month, is a game called Fortnite, which is in the middle. Which I'm sure all of you have no, know somebody who was playing that game. In Asia, League of Legends is one of the most popular games, and it's played. League of Legends, the best way to describe it is imagine chess played on a battlefield in real time. That's that's what it is. So you have to control your armies and control your players and 
figure out what the strategy is to take the other person's uh, tower down. It is an extremely difficult game to play. Um, uh, it's it's real time action combat, um, and a lot of these players are showcasing skills that you would really see in a, a real combat situation. Um, it's it's nerve wracking. It's very very few people can be at the top level because you have to have strategy, you have to have teamwork, you have to have the ability to make decisions at the microsecond level. Uh, it's an incredible. While it's not athleticism in the traditional sense. It's a sort of mental athleticism, I think, that it uh, requires. And then you have fighting games, which are just characters fighting against each other. And some of them are very, very, it seems really like, oh, we should be worried about this. You know, you have a board of parents, but it's a lot of them are like characters like Nintendo's uh, Smash Brothers is the most popular fighting game there is. And it's just like a bunch of goofy cartoon characters fighting each other. But the level of skill to be a master in that game is also extremely difficult. Um. And then you have card games that are also very, very popular. And really, this is just a very small sample of, of, of thousands of games that can be played competitively. Uh, I didn't put any mobile games here, but you could also include Clash of Clans uh, and, and, and even Tetris, which is, if you look at the Tetris World Championships, uh, they had 16 million viewers, which is more than the World Series. So <laughs> it's pretty incredible. The... Average gamer, depending on the sources, so this is, you know, they're all generally around the same. The average core gamer is a 33-year-old male and a 36-year-old female. Uh, millennials play around 14.8 hours every week. Uh, at least that's what they admit to. I'm sure that probably play about more than that. And 80% of Gen Z and millennials play games on a regular basis. So, you know, this is every generation that subsequently replaces or, or comes in to the world really becomes an endemic video game player uh, really as soon as it can pick up an iPad or a controller. And the as we discussed earlier, I'll go back to my earlier slide, the world has developed, the, the competitive video game world has developed from just being at the you know local arcade at the mall into being professional sports leagues. So in the United States, there's at least Four now, this presentation only has three of them, professional leagues dedicated to video games. And this is just like a sports league. You have a team that represents a city that plays at a stadium. Uh, you would also add Valorant to this now. Uh, so these are play are teams that are followed by tens of thousands of, of, of fans in each city. Um, one of these teams, FaZe, FaZe Clan, has I should actually put this in the presentation, so I'm going to make a note to myself. FaZe Clan has 530 million followers, which is bigger than any team of any kind in any sport in the world. Um, and they are active followers. So FaZe Clan is, is the largest organized co competitive agency in the world. So this shows you sort of how the scope and breadth of this. They're bigger than the Yankees, bigger than the Dallas Cowboys, bigger than Barcelona. <clears throat> and in the collegiate esports world, um, collegiate esports, which is uh, sort of the NCAA of, of esports, is NACE, uh, the North American Collegiate uh, Esports Association. And every year, more and more players get full scholarships to represent their school playing college esports. And if you look at the number of players, and this is a, about a year old, this slide, maybe less than a year old, there's 200 plus universities with varsity teams, which means there's some level of scholarship involved. 15,000 players, and every year grows around 50, 20%. So if you look at it from a, a compar comparative point of view, that is more than all the players in, in NCAA men's division, bas one, two, and three. Uh, basketball, lacrosse, golf, ice hockey, swimming, tennis, volleyball, and wrestling. Combine them all of them, there's more kids representing the school in esports. And it's growing. And part of the reason it's growing is because while some of these arenas, the, these kind of rooms you see here, this is Oregon State, um, these rooms may cost $100, 200 some have cost $100,000, some cost as much as $1 million, $2 million, because they have seats and these very big displays and they're very big little like mini arenas. 
that's the entire cost that you're bearing, right? You don't have a lot of travel because they play virtually. Um, you don't have a lot of insurance. You don't have the injuries. You don't have all the supporting structures that real teams have to have, like travel and all those things. These are more sustainable uh, from a cost point of view. And also, this is the first, in, there is no division one, two, and three in, in esports at NACE because even the smallest school can take on a larger school at the same level because they can afford to do so. So as an example of that, in 2019, my company hosted an event where the Rutgers University, which still has the largest esports team in the world, they, they have um, their esports club is almost 4,000 members. It's a, it's a video game club, but their esports team is around 100. They took on a new challenger, which was a Division three school called, called Stockton University in South Jersey. Uh, and, and Rutgers was the world champion, and, and Stockton beat them twice, right? They did a, they beat them the first match. Rutgers got angry. They did a rematch, and Stockton beat them again. For a Division three school to ever take on a Division one school – uh, it's almost impossible in traditional sports, but in video games, it's a pretty big deal. They have a hospitality. There might be some Stockton people on this call that just never even knew that. <laughs> well, I mean, Stockton and Rutgers are, are universities that work very closely with. Um, sure. But that they, the eSport competition went down. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and it was a big deal. And it was Stockton, yeah. you know, really promoted it very heavily that they beat Rutgers. And it was the first time, and it took us about, a couple of weeks to figure this out because we were asking both universities, have you ever played each other in any sport ever? Yeah. And it was the first time that they had ever played each other. Yeah, we're I'm at the University of Delaware and our facility looks like the the Oregon one there. It's pretty it's, it's pretty nice well done. Yeah, it's it's really nice. So I was surprised. And it's it's easy for people to support it, right? I mean, it's it's yeah. it's always there. You can walk in. Sometimes they let you use the facilities. Stu students expect it at this point, and we kind of. I mean, we've yeah. had ours, I think, for like five years. But at the time, it was still kind of schools were just getting on it, and it's it was almost a competitive advantage, right? Students, you know, giving them these opportunities to play on these teams or socially, um, and attract them to a school. And, and not like you said, now you have to have one because why don't you have one? But but as as little as three years ago, before COVID, why would I have one? Why would yeah. we do this? Like Rutgers couldn't even use their official Rutgers name until after COVID because Rutgers didn't take it seriously enough. Mm -hmm. So Rutgers had to use a different name, a non-school branded name, until Rutgers finally saw the huge appeal of uh, competitive video games. Probably shouldn't share that story, but. <laughs> so Anthony, can I ask another quick question? So yeah. the structure is a little different. So the, you know, those other sports that you list, they have division one, two, three and rocker, obviously it's part of the big 10. So that's why I never mm -hmm. will be able to. So in esports, they don't have this division thing. In esports, part of the, I'm going to put on a, a a website here called NACE. It's a North American esports, North American collegiate esports. Uh, esports. All right. So the thing about NACE is there is no NCAA. Um, yet. You're you're still showing your slides. I mean, what yeah. I see. Okay. And I just realized that. Yeah, you're right. There you go. So the there is no NCAA yet for um video game competitions and the ncaa in itself is really kind of a it's 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 not what people really think it is which is a whole different topic um uh the, the trick with establishing esports across collegiate the collegiate space is trying to figure out some middle ground some standard for how schools can have some sort of common ground in the in the amount of of, of what games are playing, so have some common games. What are the standards for those games? How they're played? What are the rules that they're going to abide by? What are the schedules that they're going to abide by? And what are the qualifications and, and do's and don'ts for those teams, right? Like you can't have these kind of players. You, you should have these kind of players. All those things are established. D1 
differently by about eight or eight, eight or uh, eight or nine different organizations in the United States. The biggest one is NACE, and this has over 700 schools now, and they've been able to organize these schools in a way that uh, makes sense to a lot of these schools, and really they are going to be the NCAA of esports. One of the good things about them is that they are not other nonprofit, so they are able to to bring the benefits of esports without a hefty cost. Um, as esports start to develop, you know, kind of related to the internet, the question about Twitch, the schools will probably the will probably make a lot of money uh, over time uh, working and getting media rights uh, from their events. Uh, NACE also creates a bunch of partnerships, including one with Esports Illustrated, my company, <clears throat> one of our companies that benefit the students by providing uh, internships, but that you get credit for uh, from your from your schools. So it's a, deeply woven into uh, the schools, just like uh, NCAA. The difference is, it, is for now, it's not a revenue generating or revenue uh, 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 doesn't cost any money for the schools right now. Nothing significant anyway. <clears throat> but of all the universe of all the systems that are in place, and I'm kind of losing my words a little bit. This is the largest, NACE is the largest one. So you'll see conference one, which we used to own. You see collegiate sports management group, ECAC, which is a long-standing uh collegiate athletic organization that, that goes not just from esports, but also traditional sports have been around for like 92 years. Um, and then there's other ones like NC and NACL and EFUs. But um, I, I do believe this is going to be well established in the next five years. NACE is. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think the next slide is about uh, the power of esports. So when we started pitching this stuff, it was in Atlantic City. And Atlantic City is a city trying to, to that, that there's had many ups and downs over the last century. Um, and I wanted to have an example of what would happen if we brought in um, competitive video games and esports to the city. So we saw a really good example in Katowice, Poland, um, that was a down and out town with little to no industry. It was one of those factory towns that just nobody was building things anymore. Uh, and in 2012, um, somebody there turned to esports as a way to bring tourism into the cities. So they they said that, uh, you know, we have this Olympic stadium. Maybe if we did something uh, to attract video game companies, we could have an event here. We could maybe improve some of the video screens. It's worth a shot. <laughs> it was kind of like the last gasp that the city had. Uh, and, and they did it in 2012. Now today, that city has been completely, totally turned around. Uh, and it builds itself as the esports capital of Europe with hosting events that draw in not thousands of fans, but tens of thousands of fans, hundreds of thousands of fans. The events that don't last a day, that last weeks. And these companies, because they come here so often, have now established bases of operations around Katowice. The, the, because the city was down and out, the uh, buying buildings and 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 spaces was relatively cheap so it, it just became sort of you know everyone started building it out so now that city is extremely 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 well known uh i've been to esports events where i've seen people walking around with hats to say kind of reach on them so i mean if you could imagine you'd have to be very creative to have seen that back in 2012 that people would walk around advertising a, a town that had nothing as the as a next tech center but that's exactly what happened. And as you see that all over the world, uh, mostly in South Korea and China, they're building esports complexes in cities, cities, university campuses based around the idea of competitive video games and the technologies it takes to build them. So STEM programming, um, you know, data analytics, uh, all these fields are built into video games, right? So video games are actually very complicated um, um, endeavors that, that include, depending on the level of the game, you could be actors, artificial intelligence, extremely high, uh, you know, cloud server technologies, uh, extremely high bandwidth technologies, 
uh, anti uh, uh, tampering technologies. I mean, it's it's this is really in a way the culmination of a lot of the entertainment and tech world into one thing. And it's only going to get bigger. And it's only and and with the advent of augmented reality, which Apple is going to introduce a product this year in June. <clears throat> you're going to see the, the the mix of the reality and, and the virtual in daily life to the point where in about 10 years, it'll become sort of hard to understand what the world was like before those technologies were invented. A lot of those things will have to do with competitive gaming. Um, so gaming is the, the, those technologies were originally created for games and are now being in a way taken from the virtual and put it into the actual so you're going to see a lot of the the way that you convey information in a very a very complex information in a very concise manner. You're going to see that as part of your daily life. So you're going to see a lot of the 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 identification systems, um, even goal setting. Like I need to do these things today, and the gamification of those things comes from video games, right? So you're going to see that overlaid over the reality. It's very exciting times moving forward. Um, artificial intelligence kind of amps up the the possibilities of how far this can go, but this is uh, something that's happening in Asia and it's also happening in the United States. So you see a lot of places uh, in the United States that are starting to build these these arenas. Um, there's actually more than I pictured here. Like a company called Glitch just started that is very heavy is building an arena in every city. So about thirty of them. And some of the teams that you saw on the team page earlier are going to be housed in this page here. So they're building arenas for a lot of these teams in these cities. And those arenas will do double time. So after, uh, you know, on the weekends or when the teams aren't playing, uh, you'll be able to have collegiate events there. You'll be able to have amateur events there, high school events there as well. So that's that's sort of the the the, the top on where the space is and how it's growing into the uh, society culturally, how it, the impact it's having. Are there any questions about that part before we move on to sort of the, the regulatory side of it? I got a quick one. Uh, I got two kids there in college. Somehow they are in Buff. They are over in Oklahoma State and they mm -hmm. play in Dallas, Texas. Um, I do have one personal experiences. They trim my uh, wallet for their new equipment setups. They trim my wallet for their. Uh, oh yeah, they're, they, they're they, they, they 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 put their own say uh, gaming PCs together, and those cost tons of money. It is not just like regular PC we have. Yeah. Uh, the point I want to share this was, is any like conferences associated with esports? or like uh, software, hardware, rather than just the sports itself? A lot. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, I'm going to go back, Frank, and talk about the, the costs. One of the biggest differences from the United States to Asia are related to the fact that most people in South Korea, uh, where I used to own a company, um, don't have the computers at home to play. They actually play them at PC bangs, which is our uh, like a bar, really a, like a bar. Yeah, yeah. There's no equivalent here in the states for it, but it's like a computer bar, right? And the, people go to the computer bar, and there are tens of hundreds of computers, and that's where they go every night, right? So these places are extremely busy. I should probably add that to this deck as well. That's another uh, <laughs> note to myself. But in America, most people have them themselves. And if you have two kids, like I do, each kid has their own computer rig, and each one is kind of on the expensive side. And that's the also the uh, the internet connection too. The regular one I use at home, they say that's not enough. They want a it's really never, high speed one, a fiber one. It's never enough, Frank. It's never enough. You can be in the same room, and it's still not enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. But the, so there are differences between Asia and the United States, but the the they're the really more differences related to how the the they're still playing the same games, but the way that they play them are different. Does that make sense? Thank you. Sure, sure. It was a good, it was a good point that you brought up. It's, I'm going to add a slide to this presentation for it. Um, so because they are so endemic. 
the idea of wagering is something that uh, naturally took off and it was something that was going to happen. It's actually been happening for about 10 years. And the way that <clears throat> the uh, iGaming casino industries are dealing with the states and regulators are to make it legal, but to figure out exactly what the processes are to make it legal. Like how do we make something that's, that's so different from mobile games to PCs, from from fighting games to games about uh, you know the simulate real sports. How do we make this like? How do we regulate it? How what how do we do it? It just it doesn't seem like there's any place you could start. Um, but we have started in Nevada and New Jersey, and in the esports regulated video game committee, which is a part of the esports trade association. We started to take the first steps to create a national series of strategies and and guidelines and frameworks to be able to have wagering take place those frameworks take into account some things we'll talk about in a second but it, it make to make sure that players are protected to make sure that players don't gamble too much or or, or or throw a match it's all the same stuff that you would see in traditional sports with the addition of making sure that people aren't hacking into the system making sure that people say who they say they are when they're playing a game online and we can't really see them um, a whole bunch of different things it's it's an enormous task but you see here that the states are blue already saying, this is what we're going to do. Um, and I would expect in the next five years, it's almost the entire country. There's always going to be some states that opt out. Um, but for the most part, we think that most of the country will have some sort of established um, strategic framework for how esports competitions for real money work. Um, this I'm going to skip. Well, I'm, I'll talk about this. Like, traditionally, part of that framework is that if you have an event, you have to submit it to a, a regulator, a state regulator, whatever state you're in. And that includes a full description of the event. What are the rules uh, that they're going to be adhered to? What kind of wagers are going to be placed? How are we going to verify that the data is correct and that the wagers were placed and the wagers were given to the right winner or loser or taken from the loser? Um, what is the makeup of the contestants? What the size of the pool? What's the location? How are you addressing fairness and integrity? Uh, what is the reputation of the event organizer? What's their history? Have they ever been, uh, has anyone ever accused them of cheating? Um, you know, and, and depending on those answers, you'll get a one-time approval. You'll get a, a, a kind of conditional approval for a number of events or an unlimited approval like the NFL has for, this is just something that we feel very, very uh, safe for this group. And we have allowed them people to use them for wagering uh, events in perpetuity until something makes us reconsider it. And then we're looking for fairness. Fairness means that someone isn't cheating. Fairness means that you are who you say you are. We had an event a couple of years ago where uh, a college team used a professional player to um, play in a, in, a, in a championship match. And we only found out because the player that had been substituted for uh, told us. Right. So you have a lot of things that you, we have to still work out. Um, and that includes, you know, methods for us, technologies that we're using to detect when somebody is trying to cheat, whether that's be using what they call aim bots, which are sort of software packages that uh, enhance your ability to shoot some software. Like, let's say there's a video game and you're hiding behind the wall and the other player can't see you. Some uh, uh, hacks will remove all obstacles. So it just looks like an open field and there are no obstacles. So you know exactly where everybody is at all times. So they can't see you, but you can definitely see them. Things like that. Uh, figuring out what dispute resolutions, how they work. So you and I play against each other. You say, hey, Anthony did this move that isn't even authorized to, to move. How do I prove that that didn't happen? Or how do I prove that it did happen? Uh, and how do we report that data back to the casinos and the states? Um, that's very important because the record keeping is extremely important when dealing with regulatory bodies. You have to keep record for 10 years. Uh, you have to be able to record gameplay matches so you can verify dispute resolutions. You have to be able to ensure the kids or people under the age of 21 are not on the platform. And you have to ensure that the people that are playing are the people who they say they are. So that you need, you know, we're starting to use the biometrics to, to make those sort of assurances. But all those things are being worked out now. There is a group called the Esports Integrity Coalition, 
that handles a lot of those things. And they, they will go as far as the professional leagues to have access to bank accounts of the players to see if wagers or money that is unexpected uh, has been placed in the player's account. So if somebody throws a match or loses a match and someone says they throw a match and then all this money shows up in their account, the ESIC often has authority to, to look at the player's bank account. Uh, just for deposits, not like what they're spending on things. <clears throat> so we talk a lot about the growth of video games and competitive video games and esports, uh, but still there's a lot of barriers to full acceptance, even though this is probably the largest entertainment media in the United States. It is, there's a line, and I call that line people that watch uh, uh, the cable line. If you're over a certain age and you still have cable, you probably don't know this other world even exists, right? <clears throat> if you're under a certain age, you definitely don't have cable and you only know this world exists. So that there's, there's a sort of red state, blue state kind of barrier, a separation between uh, uh, age groups in the United States uh, when it comes to media. The mainstream media has not accepted video games uh, very well yet. They still, for some reason, seem to think that they're for kids. However, IGN, which is a, a IGN.com, uh, which is a website dedicated to video games, has over 100 million viewers every day, which is more than almost every newspaper combined, right? So it's just one of those things that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense the way that it's portrayed because the reality doesn't, doesn't follow that portrayal. Uh, there is no recognized overarching governing body for esports. NACE is maybe the first attempt to do it at the collegiate space, but other than NACE, there really doesn't there isn't any other overarching body. Um, the biases we talked about, you know, people in kid, you know, people in basements playing video games is, is completely untrue. Uh, I mean, like I said, in my family, I have two athletes and that's all they do is they, they go compete and they play video games. So it's, it's just not true that the, the stereotypes about people uh, being basement dwellers. And the content and availability of wagering opportunities have to be expanded which means that we have to figure out what the structures are to, to, to create that integrity that people want to see, to feel safe on their wage rate. Um, my company just launched yesterday, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> Esports Illustrated, which is a, a, a long-term partnership with Sports Illustrated. So we are their division for video games uh, and we are gonna cover video games in the same way that they cover, uh, have covered sports. And the the great thing about it is that uh, you know we we believe the time is now to make video games and competitive video games a reality in the mainstream. And I think we're the first attempt to try to do so. I know ESPN had some coverage of video games, but this is uh, our company. I think is the first attempt to do it. I'm going to try to put on. Uh, what yeah, it's thought. a good good point. I, I I did already check out the website. It looks brand new. They uh, it, yeah, I I noticed the other day ESPN is they, they took it all down. They they're not doing it anymore. So I couldn't find it. The problem with the problem with um, what they had done with ESPN was how how do I how do we get to the heart of this one? So you, you look at this image uh, here. You see this image here. <laughs> This image here is a playful image that we know you have to have the culture of video games reporting on the culture of video games, right? Sure. You can't have people in suits and ties report on, on, on video games because it's so completely out of line with what, <laughs> with what anybody in that, you know, under that cable crowd, I talked about that line, expect. It wouldn't make any sense for them to see people in ties talking about video games. They're used to seeing people in sweatshirts uh, talk about video games people in sweatshirts and have tens of millions of viewers right yeah. so it isn't about the size it's about the expectations and the cultural norms and the way that we're approaching this is in line with what uh, we believe is is what's expected in this space right so cool. we're going to report endemically so a lot of our reporters are actually either players streamers content creators or collegiate students in the space so we hope that this is exactly where uh the space needs to be in order to grow do you guys have standings on there or no i'm just curious we yeah we're working on this so we just launched yesterday so we're going to have the standings 
I mean, a lot of what we're doing too is the who, what, when, and where. Like, who should I watch? What teams are important? What events are important? When are they happening? Sure. Where I should watch it? We're still sure. working on the tech side of that. Like, so there's a lot of stuff that we're still trying to iron out when it comes to putting the ticker for the scores. Um, there's a player database that's a real a big part of what we're doing. So you'll know all the player stats. Um, there's a lot of things. I mean, this has been an enormous effort uh, yeah. that we put on, and it's only half of what our company does. So. Um, we're pretty happy with the results so far. Uh, we got a really good reception yesterday, but we've been building this behind the scenes for about four months now. So um, it'll take about 12 to 18 months really to, for us to see whether or not our direction is working. We're going to be very, very heavily relying on video uh, because that's the that's what people are looking for these days. Yeah, more than print. Um, and then finally, we have what's called the gray market. The gray market is wagering on video games that's already taking place without the approval of any regulators, without the approval of any game companies, uh, completely unregulated, uh, non-compliant gaming. Some of these companies make almost a billion dollars a year. And this is something that my uh, committee, the Regulated Video Games and Esports Committee is, is was created to sort of facilitate. My other side of the company, uh, we're creating a regulated video game and esports panel, but it's fully compliant with all state regulations and all state regulators. Um, but you see here, there's a very large space now of video games that you can play without having to tell people how old you are, without having to tell people what state you're in, without having to tell people anything about yourself, but you use credit cards, which are illegal in, in iGaming, um, but you use credit cards to potentially create a whole bunch of debt for yourself that you have to pay off. That's one of the reasons credit cards are not legal in gaming is because they've shown people have shown to be able to not handle the ability to, to, to control themselves. But a lot of these companies uh, unregulated don't have any problem with that. So it's a space that's growing and you see some of the, the problems that you, that, that are created by this um, loot, boxes which is when you pay a certain amount of money in a video game to get a random prize is essentially a slot machine and electronic arts makes three thousand dollars a minute on just one game fifa on loot crate mechanics and those game as recently as like two days ago countries are banning those mechanics as unregulated gaming uh the netherlands australia japan um south korea those a lot of countries are banning it. Uh, Sweden, uh, because it's 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 an addictive, unregulated uh, practice that that kids are spending a lot of money on, without anybody really understanding the implications of it. Um, and I think that's all I have for the presentation. I mean, I, I, if you have a, a few minutes, I could I'd love to take questions, but for the presentation part of it, I hope I wasn't too boring this morning. Um, but that's sort of the, the introduction to esports. Does Thank anybody you. have any questions or yeah, observations? Uh, Linda, saw your hands up. Yes, hi. Um, I came in a little late. I saw you know most of it. Um, I guess my first my gut reaction is. Um, can you talk about the energy consumption and sustainability? It looks like this is massive amounts of energy use and we're all being told to cut back the energy uh, for sustainability. And this looks like it's just, you know, a lot of energy consumption. It's, it's a lot. I mean, I think the, the, I don't know if it's, see the, the question is the only, alternative would be to going outside, which is what I want my kids to do every day. Um, but whether they're staying at home or if they're staying at home, they're probably going to be on some device anyway. A lot of these computers are pretty energy intensive. Um, some stuff has been done to try to reduce that footprint, but I can't disagree. It, it is an energy uh, uh, hog. You know, I, I don't feel too bad at my house because we have solar power where we end up giving money back most months. To the power grid, but for homes that aren't set up that way, you're right. It is something that uh, that really no one needs taking a good look at it yet. And there's really aren't. Well, I think I was more there. interested in the energy consumption of the stadiums you're talking about. That looks massive. 
Oh, those things are huge. But I, I would say in that situation, it's no different than a traditional sporting event. Right. So if you, you know, I went to uh, my company has tickets for the 76ers in Philadelphia. It's the, the screen, everything's the same, right? Everything's pretty much the same. So um, I don't think it's any different in that respect, but I do think I agree with you. It, it is a lot of uh, energy that's being kind of used up to <laughs> those things. Okay. Thank Anthony, you. I, Anthony, I do not have solar power panel at home. But I do see the significant amount of electric bill. It does. It's really significant. Yeah, and I think we have to. All of us have to figure out how we're going to deal with these issues in the future. You know, as more and more people, you know, I mean, right now, electronic devices are. I mean, we're doing it right now, right? We're talking through computers, so it's something that we have to figure out as a society how we're going to deal with it. At the same time, those uh, gaming bars set up in the U.S. It is not quite popular yet. Um, I teach a classes to start a small business, and a group of my students they want to start the uh, gaming bars after I introduced that the concept to them, and they are really excited. Uh, I'm here right by Pittsburgh areas, so uh, this is so dry to esports at this moment, but. Um, Students, they got a taste of it. I think they, they, they feel there's a need and market. Um, I hope, Anthony, you might come over uh, to show what you have to our students. <laughs> uh, I, I like traveling. So yeah, I would love any of its video games and traveling together. That's what I love. Thank you. I got one quick last one. Can, this is kind of a dumb question, but can, can they play cross platform like can an xbox person in this game play a playstation person in the same thing or is that regulated uh for, for the wagering side of it well i guess I'm, I'm thinking just the competition side like i don't like yeah i don't know like i was looking like people like i, I looked up our team during this they have overwatch it's like well you can play that a lot of different ways like does it matter if how somebody comes on and plays like no i mean a lot of these games are cross compatible so you'll have people that are playing on an i mean the best example is over is uh a Fortnite. you could even play it well you used to be able to play it before they got into a lawsuit uh you can yeah. play it on a phone right so it, it a lot of it is completely cost compatible so it doesn't sure. matter what the uh the platform is and the developers have taken the steps to make sure that there's no advantage from one uh yeah. college from one uh, uh platform to the other okay good to know uh, in terms of ethical issues, this happened in Asia a lot. Me, myself, coming from Taiwan, and I have friends, and I don't know if my kids in that or not. Uh, I don't touch their gaming things. But I saw this on the news. Uh, they are computer game developers. They are getting so big on certain games, and they cannot handle those gamers, which is players um, on the platform. They ended up shut down the platform and get lawsuits from those gamers. Uh, how do you see that maybe happening through esports and what might be ethical issues involved? Dude, what was the lawsuit about? That lawsuit? Uh, it is about a gaming developer company. They put they, they have different games and they, there was a one really popular and people spent tons of money on it. And when they play on it, some of those gamers, they they use um, sidekicks or whatever you call it uh, to oh, play right. it. Right. And, and, and they cannot really handle it and get it so big. So uh, some of those uh, people, they put tons of money in it to develop themselves into those games. They ended up suing that company. You mean, so they couldn't stop playing? Yeah, well, I mean, there's it's a not, lot of They couldn't stop it. It's like... They cannot handle people go around the system and try to get a loopholes and things like that. I think they are more than the issue I described. It's just the developers, they cannot handle that big enough fans and, and gamers uh, create different issues going on. Yeah, it's live service. They call it live services is how you take a game and put it into an environment where it could be played by millions of people, thousands of people. And you have a lot of different people that are doing, trying to do a lot of different things the game wasn't designed to do, right? Um, it's 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 a tough business, 
you know, like my other side of the company, we have live operations that we're getting ready for. Uh, it is incredibly complicated and complex. So the, the best way to look at it is when you look at the price of a video game, a lot of people really don't understand all the stuff that goes behind that. But from a development point of view, you know, these games often have hundreds of people developing them at an average salary of $100,000, starting at an average salary of $100,000. They're expensive. And then when you go into the wild, you never know what the uh, what the audience is going to do, right? Like you hope that everybody plays fair, but the reality is that they don't. And you get all this kind of crazy results um, that result in lawsuits, players getting banned, games getting shut down, gamers shutting games down. Um, just, you know, it's humanity, right? It, it's in, in all forms, the good and the bad. Yeah, and, and add money I to believe it, the, a little crazy, the right? law probably, the law and regulation probably not catch up at this moment yet for doing things like that, is it? It has not. It has not in any way. And, and it's the same thing for crypto, right? So this space moves so fast that the law doesn't catch up. I think part of the problem is that the law still has that bias that they think it's kids and they don't really expect something like that to happen in a kid's world. But it, it, we talked about earlier, this isn't a kid's world anymore. It hasn't been for a long time, even though the perception is that it, that it is. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you, uh, Tim and Frank's question, and and of course Linda. So um, it's ten o three, and so um, I know everybody has a lot of meeting on Fridays. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, and thank you so so much for Anthony for this very informative, uh, uh session. And then uh, so, uh, we have um, we also uh had a send out Anthony's uh information so if everyone if you're a program wants to get a, a hold of anthony i'm sure anthony you're welcome everybody's get in touch with you right yeah i i love answering questions so anybody wants to get in touch with me you can also see me on linkedin anthony god on linkedin it's probably the easiest way to get in touch with me as well so feel free to email me or contact me on linkedin and i'll answer any questions you have thank you so much well, uh, everyone, thanks again for joining us. Uh, have a nice weekend. Yeah. Great to meet you. Thanks. Good luck. Thank you, guys. Have a good weekend. Take care.